welcome you to Milan presented by Association for India's Development Ann Arbor and Detroit chapter. We are glad to be here today uh, and the topic of discussion today is Kisan Swaraj an interactive meeting with Kiran Visa. We are also happy that you all want to learn more about how can we help empower farmers in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. To describe a brief overview of Association for India's development, AID is a non-profitable charitable organization founded in 1991, promoting sustainable, equitable, and just development across India. We have more than 30 chapters across 30 cities in USA, and AID, Ann Arbor, and Detroit are chapters part of Central AID. We do various events across the year, such as art fair, speaker talks, and raise funds to support projects back in India. We also meet up once in two weeks uh, to discuss about the project updates and other events. Uh, we do a book club. We do have a book club where we discuss about uh, books about um, economic development in India and similar topics. If you are willing to volunteer with us, do sign up. Uh, there is a link provided to sign up in the chat box. Currently, we are handling various projects between the two chapters. Um, under different domains. From agriculture, we have Kisan Mitra and Makam, which is Mahila Kisan Adhikar Manch. In education, we are supporting projects uh, like Snehi Bhavan and Kadam Ed Education Initiative. For community empowerment, we are supporting projects like Lok Shakti Manch and Odisha Forest Rights and Watershed Management. Today, our aim is to, in the, through this event, we are trying to support these projects and um, we are encouraging people to donate so that we'll be able to reach our target of $10,000. Coming to the topic of discussion today, it's farmers and their issues. Did you guys know in the last 10 years, Indian farmers have raised the food crop production by almost 150%? That's a huge leap from 220 million tons to 330 million tons. And also in the same time span, there have been more than 150,000 Indian farmers have committed suicide. Even now, every half hour, one farmer commits a suicide. To depict this plight of farmers, we have a, our youngest volunteer, Akshita Jagadishan, rendering a song from a Telugu movie, and the song is called Niru Niru. Over to Akshita. Can you hear me? Hello? Hello? Yes, we can hear you. Oh, okay. Okay, so um, I will be singing um, Niru Niru from Kaidi number 150. And there I go. Uh, Akshita, it's very soft. Is it possible to um, increase your volume? My volume. Um, is it better now? A little bit. Okay, should I do it a bit more? Uh, yeah, if you can. Okay. Um, okay, is it, is it yes. better now? Okay. Yes. Akshita, do you want to share your screen, the video, and? Um, can you please let me share my screen? Um. Or can the admin? Oh, you you're sharing. Yeah. Okay. Can you see the screen? Yes. Okay. Can you hear the music? 
Yes. Niru niru niru, rai tu khanta niru, chuda ne na chuda ru varu. Gunde lanni biru, asalan. Beautifully sung, Amakshata. Hello. Thank you so much, Akshita, uh, for you. singing this beautiful song. It really took back as everyone to the. farmers land and we could see the distress faced by the farmers i don't know about others but even staying away from uh, india so far away uh, this young child has literally put us in tears i feel um thank you akshita so, for the song no no what the farmers are facing in india um i know it's very hard for them um and they don't get the respect that they deserve in india um and it's very nice to see that the amount of crops that they have produced has 
um, increased by 150%. I'm really um, glad to see that. Um, and I hope this will continue in the future. Um, thank you. So here we are to learn more about how can we be part of the solution? How can we lend a hand to the farmer who keeps our country alive? Today we have with us uh, Mr. Kiran Visa, a long-time social activist who works on issues related to farmers' rights and sustainable agriculture in India. He has been part of AID for the almost past 15 to 20 years. And he's also the convener, convener of Raitu Swaraj Vedika, which works to ensure sustainable livelihoods for farming communities in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana. We do have an interactive question and answer session at the end, but if you do, if you have any questions, please do post it in the chat box so that we can take up the questions later. Over to Kiran. Hello, Kiran. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Surjana, and uh, thanks a lot, Akshita, for that uh, song. Uh, it was very moving and very well sung. Uh, I'm actually very glad to be here uh, with all of you. Uh, uh, you know, I, on a personal note, actually, it is uh, 25 years uh, since I joined AID. And, uh, uh, you know, I had come to the US uh, at, at the end of August uh, 1995 uh, to do my grad studies uh, at University of Maryland. And uh, 25 years, uh, I, and from almost the very first day that I landed in the US, I became part of AID uh, in Maryland. Uh, and uh, since then, basically, uh, I think my interaction with AID, with AID volunteers, with all the people that AID works with in India, that has really shaped my life. And uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, irrespective of what difference it has made in other people's lives, I think it really has enriched my life and uh, made it much more meaningful. Uh, so I really thank AID for that and thank all the AID volunteers for, uh, uh, you know, for, for putting many, many, many people on such journey uh, where, uh, you know, uh, your life uh, really changes and the way that you look at things uh, really changes. So that's what it did for me. Uh, so I would like to uh, share my screen, uh, uh, Sujana, if you... Uh, can everybody see my screen? Yes. yes, Kiran. Right. Okay. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So we are we are talking about farmers uh, today. Uh, you know, like Sujana said, uh, it's also uh, you know October second. Yesterday it was uh, Gandhi's uh, uh, birthday. Uh, it's uh, more than one fifty years uh, since uh, you know Gandhi was born, and uh, he took. Uh, our country, uh, you know, through a very turbulent period, uh, you know, the freedom struggle. Uh, I want to just uh, start with a thought, uh, you know, maybe one of the most profound thoughts of Gandhi, uh, basically, uh, which is known as a Gandhi's talisman. Uh, he said, I will give you a talisman whenever you are in doubt or when the self becomes uh, uh, too much. Uh, apply the following test, uh, recall the face of the uh, poorest and most marginalized man or woman, you know, you may have seen. And if the step uh, that you contemplate is uh, going to be of use uh, to him or, or to her, uh, will he gain anything? Will it restore a control uh, over his uh, life or destiny? Uh, and will it bring Swaraj basically to the hungry and spiritually starving millions? Uh, then you will find your doubts uh, melting away. So you will know basically what to do. Uh, I think uh, that uh, uh, has been a guiding force, uh, you know, for many of us in aid and many of us who are working uh, with all these issues in India. Uh, essentially, uh, I think uh, when Gandhi or you know other people who are fighting in the freedom movement, uh, when they were fighting for Swaraj, uh, that Swaraj uh, did not merely mean uh, an independence, uh, political independence from the British. 
but it also meant uh, that the common people of India should be able to have more control uh, over their own destiny, uh, more freedom uh, to do what they want to do, uh, uh, you know, more uh, 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 basically uh, at least the basic rights, uh, which includes the right to live, uh, should be uh, there for all the people. And uh, like the song which Akshita has just sung, uh, indicates uh, basically farmers who are actually producing food for the country, uh, you know, don't even seem to have the basic right to live uh, protected uh, in this country. So that is the, uh, I mean, that shows that, you know, uh, political independence itself is not enough. Uh, we are still, uh, we still have a long way to go towards Swaraj. Uh, so uh, that's the reason why we think of our work as uh, Kisan Swaraj, you know, that was the title of the presentation also. Um, that uh, farmers, you know, when we say Kisan, uh, farmers, it doesn't mean only the people who own land. Uh, you know, it means anybody who works in the fields, uh, including the landless laborers, including people who rear animals, uh, you know, it could be cows, goat, sheep or poultry, uh, people who are working with the natural resources, Adivasi farmers who often don't have title to the land. Uh, it is basically a real swaraj uh, for all of them, uh, you know, that uh, we are working for. Uh, so, uh, like uh, Sujana has already said, basically, uh, in the last 10 years, Indian farmers have raised its food crop production uh, 1.5 times. Um, but uh, at the same time, uh, 150,000 farmers, uh, that is 1.5 lakh uh, farmers have committed suicide. Uh, which means every half an hour one farmer commits suicide in India. So uh, basically what this means is that the farmers are doing their job. Farmers are doing their part, uh, which is to produce uh, things which are of essence to the nation. See, these are things which without which the nation cannot survive, you know, whatever the farmers are producing. Uh, it's not like producing an Apple iPhone, uh, without which, uh, uh, you know, billions of people are surviving in the world. Uh, so, uh, while performing such an essential task and while doing the job, you know, raising uh, production, uh, making it 1.5 times in 10 years is not a, uh, uh, you know, is not something which is done without putting all their resources, their heart and soul and blood and sweat and tears into it. But uh, still, uh, the fact that they're committing suicide means that the nation has failed them. So, they have served the nation, the nation has failed them. So, I think that is what is the reality that uh, uh, you know we have before us. Uh, so, uh, see in this, uh, uh, in my talk, uh, I, I would like to uh, share some stories with you essentially, uh, and uh, uh, help us all hear voices, uh, you know, from India, from the villages of India. And uh, uh, the problems of agriculture itself are so complex and intertwined uh, that, uh, you know, uh, I, I would not like to get into an analysis uh, of everything, but mainly focus on, uh, hearing the voices from India, understanding a little bit of the reality, and then focusing on how we can make a difference and what difference we are making. Uh, so I would like to just share a video uh, with you. Uh, this is from uh, a village in uh, Nalgonda district in Telangana. ఏకనారంటే <laughs> <laughs> Nan Fatagaka, if it was Adukon Voyachi, under in the Karunte, he may eat Kamayo in. Where go you in? If I am a dan with an Indian Batkin, he proved at me. Nabera Shane, Nin degree first year graduate. Mind club Manana, Nini eighth class in the Champaido, Borlesi, Macapelli Capulici. I teach a lake and pain. My inclined the runner in time, Mamalva teach chorus. Nene Alice Lala, Nala School Kisarialaka, Itka Batilu, Urikotalu, 
అలాగే పని దొరికితే ఆ పని చేసి ఇంట్లో ఇంట్లో ఎలా తీసేటోళ్ళము నేను చదువుకోవాలని నాకు ఆశ ఉండే కానీ కొన్ని రోజులు చదువుకోలేకపోయినా నాకు ఎన్టి ముఖ్యంగా ఇస్తారన్న కొండలన్న వచ్చి మాకు ఇన్ఫర్మేషన్ ఇచ్చిర్రు ఇలా వస్తారమ్మా నువ్వు నువ్వు చదువుకోలేకపోతున్నావు కదా ఇంట్లో ఇబ్బందులు అనేసి మాకు ఆ మేడం ద్వారా ఒక అకౌంట్ ఓపెన్ చేయించి అందులో కొందరు ఈ వీడియో టెలికాస్ట్ చేసి కొన్ని మనీ వచ్చినాయి ఆ మనీ తోటి నేను కొంత చదువుకున్నాను ఇప్పుడు ఇప్పుడు చదువుకుంటున్నాను డిగ్రీ ఫస్ట్ అందరికీ ఒక విన్నపం మా నాన్న చనిపోయినట్టుగా ఎవరి తల్లిదండ్రులు చనిపోవద్దు అలా అని ఎవరికి చదువుకోవాలనుకున్న వాళ్ళని చదివించండి ఎంత కష్టమైనా అలా గవర్నమెంట్ అందరికి సహాయపడుతుందని కోరుకుంటున్నాను Yeah, so uh, that's the story of Ashwini. Uh, you can imagine basically a 13-year-old girl uh, who, uh, you know, because her father, who was a farmer, committed suicide, uh, ended up working in brick kilns. You know, it's one of the hardest uh, physical manual work that you can imagine, uh, working in brick kilns. And uh, she ended up working in brick kilns at the age of 13 uh, to feed her family. Uh, her mother uh, you know was physically handicapped uh, and i uh, lost her father and uh, uh, th- this is the story not just of ashwini you know it is the story of uh, thousands of uh, children unfortunately who are losing their parents um, you know due to farmer suicides and the entire family I mean, if you imagine why this farmer uh, had committed suicide uh, you know, obviously uh, he was uh, in deep debt uh he had that some bore wells for cultivation and uh, those uh bore wells dried up he was not getting loans from the bank so therefore he had to borrow money from a money lender and so on so uh, these are people who are in a, a very vulnerable position that is the reason why uh, he ended up committed committing suicide now you can imagine that uh, the family which is left behind is in a much more vulnerable situation uh, so among the most distressed farmer families uh these are even more distressed because you know they've lost the uh, main person who uh, was uh, uh, you know running the farm and working the fields uh, uh so uh, this kind of situation is faced by a uh, whole uh, lot of people unfortunately like i said 150000 farmers have committed suicide in the last uh, 10 years uh and uh, uh, as the story indicates as ashwini's story indicates uh you know from our uh, side you know people who are working with us uh, based in andhra pradesh and telangana one of our main focuses has been uh to reach out to such families where farmers have committed suicide and uh, try to be of assistance uh, to make sure that the family gets back onto its, uh, its feet uh and uh, uh, in the case of ashwini for example uh, we were able to link up with a uh, uh you know media people who are interested in covering stories of farmer suicides and one sort of story was telecast many people came forward to uh, help and uh, in this way we are actually uh, i mean that that uh, you know ntv doing a story about a farmer suicide uh, is not a common thing uh, so in that sense it's an uncommon story but it is a common story in the sense that there are actually thousands of people uh, who are uh ready uh, to help uh, such families in distress uh, it is a matter of uh, actually taking these stories uh, to the people uh, working with the families on the ground to find out what their requirements are and then linking with people who are ready to help uh, who may be aid supporters uh, either like uh, all of you you know who have joined this meeting or it could be some uh, people who are working in hyderabad or uh, bangalore or anywhere you know uh, so uh, that's the kind of bridging role uh, you know that we have been playing as part of the organization called raithu swaraj vedika you know for which i work uh, so that's one example where we've been able to make a difference in her life uh, just yesterday we were talking to one uh, another girl uh, whose farm father had committed suicide uh, more than 7 years ago and we started helping uh, that girl to get through her studies uh thankfully now she actually got a job in a software company uh she is working in delhi 
and uh, she is very keen on uh, supporting uh, you know more farmers and more farmers in distress uh, so we are uh, you know this network uh, called writers for ajwedika it is building far and wide uh, you know gathering more people uh, who are like minded who are interested in uh, supporting farmers uh, so uh, what are the causes of farmers distress you know which are pushing farmers into suicide uh there are many causes like i said you know we won't make this as an analysis of uh, you know all the uh, issues necessarily uh, but you have been seeing uh, i think in the news uh, there are a lot of farmers agitations going on across the country and one of the main issues is that farmers are not getting a fair price uh, for their produce uh, uh, you know they are they are toiling hard they are putting in a lot of investment they are taking risk Uh, to do the production and the production is also increasing every year even in this uh, time of uh, uh, you know the corona uh, crisis and everything uh, you can see that while the uh, gdp of india has shrunk by 24% uh, which is you know just simply unimaginable you know the kind of uh, impact that uh, has on especially the poor people in the country uh but agriculture as a sector has grown by almost 4% 3.5 to 4% uh which means that even in the, this kind of a crisis situation farmers are continuing to do their job for the country but they are not getting a fair price uh you know for their produce and that's the reason why they are angry now they are on the streets saying that you know the government also has a role in making sure that the markets are fair uh to the farmers and uh, unfair markets and unremunerative prices is one of the things which is pushing farmers into suicide uh, farmers into distress and i also just wanted to say that for every farmer who commits suicide uh, there would be at least another 500 such farmers who are in a similar state of uh, distress economic distress uh, and social distress but they are not just taking that uh, you know the extreme step of committing suicide so it's not just 150000 farmers uh, you know who are in distress it is Uh, maybe find it times more that you know which means you are talking about uh, you know at least a uh, 10 or 20 million farmers uh, who are in that kind of a distress uh, so uh, obviously indebtedness lack of finance many of them uh, don't get bank loans they end up taking loans from the money lenders and the same money lenders uh, are also input dealers who sell them fertilizers and seed uh, and then the same money lenders are the ones who uh buy their produce so they don't even get to bargain for the price because you are already indebted to that dealer and you have taken loan from the same dealer so you are forced to sell your produce to the to the same dealer at a uh, you know lower price uh, than what you would get otherwise if you are a free uh, agent right uh, so in a sense uh, uh, actually farmers through this indebtedness problem are getting hit thrice uh you know at the input side uh, and uh, paying a lot of interest to the money lenders uh, which is 24 to 36% and also at the output end because you end up selling uh, your uh, crop immediately after the harvest because you have to repay the loan and often to the same person who gives you the loan right uh, so this kind of a vicious cycle is what the farmers are caught up in and when there are natural calamities like drought and uh, floods and so on uh, there is no risk coverage there is no proper functioning insurance so they make a loss uh, they go into debt Uh, and uh, the cost of agriculture are increasing and especially in the whole green revolution paradigm high use of fertilizers and so on uh, that has become very unsustainable also and uh, also there is a big inequality in the villages uh, you know there are farmers who own land there are many agricultural workers who don't own land but they are taking land on lease uh, from land owners uh, many times these land owners may be actually uh, working in hyderabad or bombay or the us or dubai uh, but they own land uh, here back in telangana or andhra pradesh and they lease the land to tenant farmers but the tenant farmers do not get any bank loans and so on so we'll talk about those problems also later but these are the kind of inequalities which are there you know in the ownership of land and resources and then the whole ecological crisis of depleting soil fertility uh, you know water table and depleting that biodiversity and so on so these are the kind of web of problems in which uh, the indian farmers are are uh, trying to navigate uh, and uh, in this whole thing you know for each of these issues if you see uh, there is a big role for the government to play uh, not in terms of you know giving out a dole to farmers uh, but in terms of providing support systems uh, basically in any country uh, for Kiran, any enterprise uh, Kiran there's a request for you to um, use slide show mode if possible ah, in, the, okay. in the presentation right sure thanks Uh, is my audio okay yeah audio is okay yeah uh, so uh, uh, 
Right. You were saying so I'm, I'm saying the that the role of the government is very important because uh, you know anywhere in the world uh, there have to be a certain kind of support systems which exist for agriculture to sustain, uh, and not just agriculture, any enterprise. Uh, see, basically, agriculture is uh, essentially the biggest enterprise in India, and each farmer is an entrepreneur. And uh, you know that any enterprise will not uh, sustain, uh, you know, unless there is an environment uh, which provides finance, which provides risk coverage. Uh, you know, uh, there is a bankruptcy protection for companies because if somebody is taking a risk uh, to set up a company, uh, and uh, you know the company goes under due to no, uh, let let's say, uh, 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 you know, due to some fault of the. Uh, you know, person who's running it, or due to no fault of the person who's running it, but essentially the person should not be on the road lose uh, their entire house and uh, uh, you know all their savings and so on. So there is a concept of limited liability. There's a concept of bankruptcy protection and so on, which is necessary for an enterprise to uh, uh, to flourish. Uh, but these are all not available for the farmers, or even if they're available, they're not functioning properly. Uh, so this is the kind of environment in which the fa farmers have to function. So these are all the causes of the farmers' distress. So, uh, like I said, you know, what do we do? I think that our uh, focus is on how we can make a difference. Obviously, the problems are very complicated. So uh, there are many ways where we can make an intervention, and people like us are always looking at you know what are the most effective ways of making an intervention. Uh, so aid has basically taken a three-pronged uh, approach. Uh, one element is basically uh, relief from distress. Uh, so the farmers who are really in distress, they could be farmers who suicide families, they could be, uh, you know, farmers who suffered a crop loss due to drought or due to floods and so on. So they need some immediate support. Uh, then uh, we also need to take up projects uh, which actually result in better incomes for the farmers, better sustainability, uh, ecological sustainability for the farms and so on. So that's the second aspect. The third aspect is making government work. Like I was saying, you know, many of these things are intertwined with what kind of government systems are available for the farmers. Uh, so uh, we need to work with the government at two levels. One is uh, whatever systems are available, they need to be accessible to the farmers. They need to be functional, right? Uh, and then we also need new and better policies for the farmers. So both policy advocacy as well as implementation of the existing policies. So these are the three major aspects on which we are working and uh, uh, and all this work has to happen simultaneously because if we only focus on relief uh, then the long term issues are not getting solved then more and more people actually end up in that kind of a distress situation uh, so this is a three pronged approach that aid has taken so i'll just give you a few glimpses of what we are doing uh, this is uh, you know one of the examples uh, from anantapur district uh, uh, you know where we helped a farmer suicide family her name is sugunamma uh, with uh, you know buying five sheep uh, so that helps her in, uh, you know, re-establish her livelihood after the farmer suicide. Uh, we also helped uh, drought-affected farmers in Anantapur district uh, when crops are submerged in Tamil Nadu floods. Uh, we uh, assisted, and similarly in West Bengal when there's a cyclone. Uh, so these are the kind of uh, uh, help that we can give to distressed farmers. And one of the approaches of our network has been that. Uh, it is not just, uh, uh, you know, that we need to get money from a particular source or, you know, like only an aid project is supporting these uh, people. Uh, but uh, uh, the, the network that we've established, which includes some full-timers uh, who are, uh, you know, in turn supported by aid uh, through some projects, uh, these full-time activists that we have are playing a key role in highlighting the problems of the farmers, bringing them to the notice of the larger society, and we are mobilizing support from various sources. Uh, so just like in one year, we help uh, 380 farmers who save families. Uh, so about 20 lakhs of support has gone to the uh, farm, uh, uh, to the farms who save families. And, uh, 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 and I'd like to sh uh, share another story where uh, it goes beyond, uh, uh, you know, providing private support uh, to the farm uh, to the farmers in distress, but also leveraging government support. Because ultimately, uh, if so many thousands of farmers are in distress, uh, through private uh, initiative, we may be able to reach only to some of them. Uh, but we also need to uh, make sure that the government support reaches them. Uh, so uh, I'll just share with you another video. This one doesn't have subtitles, so I'll just do a little bit of translation. I won't show uh, the, the entire video. This is for Warangal district. Uh, 
వీళ్ళ పేరు సముద్రాల వెంకటయ్య కేసీఆర్ మొదటి విడతగా రైతు ఆత్మహత్యలు గుర్తించే లిస్టులో యాభై రెండు మందిలో వరంగల్లో వైస్ స్వరాజ్య వేదికగా మనం ఆర్టీ వేసినప్పుడు వాళ్ళు యాభై రెండు మంది పేర్లు ఇచ్చాడు తిరిగి పరిహారం ఇచ్చే ముందు ముగ్గురు పేర్లు రిజెక్ట్ చేసినట్టుగా ఇచ్చాడు దాంట్లో సముద్రాల వెంకటయ్య గుడిస ఉమ్మ పెద్ది మహేష్ కారణాలు ఏందని చెప్పంటే ముగ్గురు వేరు వేరు కారణాలు సముద్రాల వెంకయ్య ఏదో ఇంటి నిర్మాణం వల్ల అప్పులు అయింది కనుక సో దిస్ ఇస్ అన్ యాక్టివిస్ట్ కాల్ వీరం రాములు హూ ఇస్ వన్ ఆఫ్ ద కోర్ మెంబర్స్ ఆఫ్ అవర్ ఆర్గనైజేషన్ హియర్ Uh, and we are visiting a farmer suicide family uh, you know the farmer's name was samudrala venkatayya and uh, uh, you know we are pursuing cases of uh, you know hundreds of such farmers to make sure that they get a government support so the government has a scheme whereby when a farmer commits suicide then the government actually steps in and uh, provides a relief to the farmer suicide family and they are supposed to in telangana supposed to provide 6 lakh rupees uh, 600000 rupees uh, to the farmer family and in andhra pradesh it's 700000 rupees but often uh, most often actually uh, uh, almost in 75% of the cases this support actually doesn't reach the farmer so we need to pursue these cases uh, diligently to actually make sure that more of these uh, farmers get the uh, support from the government uh, so biram ramli is one of a very committed activists in that uh, sense and uh, when we made this trip also uh, uh, in one of our volunteers from aid seattle was visiting uh, so uh, often our volunteers from the us uh visit uh, you know whatever projects are being supported interact with the people on the ground uh, to actually find out what is the reality what are the uh, you know situations that are being faced and how our uh, support is making a difference in this case uh, this lady uh, uh, you know biram ramlu actually filed a case in the lokayukta which is a local court uh, to make sure that there are at least 52 families uh, fa- farmers suicide families which did not get support from the government uh, so after his case actually 52 families got a sanction of the support uh, but then this uh, lady's uh, support was stopped uh, you know three of those cases were actually uh, rejected uh, because of some reason that the government is giving you know basically saying that uh, this person did not take a loan uh, i mean did not get into debt because of agriculture but got into debt because uh, he was uh, constructing a house right you can see the house of the person in the background uh, so uh, uh, you know uh, uh, having a very basic uh, uh, you know living uh, standard uh, includes you know having a house having uh, you know say being able to send the children to uh, school and so on or even you know getting your daughter married see these are all the basic requirements of uh, you know social life in india and the, the point is that the agriculture should be able to support that and uh, if you make losses in agriculture and uh, then you'll have to take a you'll get get into a debt uh, you know even for constructing a basic house like this right uh, so all those uh, you know the, the people who are getting into debt uh, for any of the economic reasons uh, because they're not getting enough income from farmers our argument is that they all should be considered as the farmer suicide uh, and uh, that is the uh, thing which we actually won in the court and that's the reason why this lady uh, actually got 6 lakh rupees 600000 rupees from the government uh through the initiative of uh, biram ramlu that's basically her story i won't play the entire thing because it doesn't have subtitles some of you may not be able to follow telugu uh but essentially what she has been saying is that when we visited is peddi mahesh lo anarogyam valla anarogyam valla apply innu result illaku appudu unna jaru vachindi sir gurtundi kada gurtu vachina idharmo ramarika vallu amarika vallu kuda vachindi sir sir kuda kishta kada nu kuda maatlaadu sir sir ఆత్మహత్య చేసుకునే ముందర చాలా మంది దగ్గర కౌలు తీసుకున్నారు చాలా మంది దగ్గర తీసుకున్నారు సార్ చెప్పలేము ఇక మా ఆయన రాయి తీయలేదు so this is a key point also because uh, see she is somebody i mean her, her family uh, i mean when i say uh, you know the farmer samudrala venkatayya basically the women in the family also play an equal role in the cultivation so it's basically both uh, her and her husband who are doing the cultivation and uh, they had taken a lot of land on lease to cultivate because they have only one acre of land now uh, the government says that you know you don't have any written agreement uh, so how do we know that you have taken it on lease 
the reality is that all over telangana or even in andhra pradesh actually lot of land is taken on these uh, for cultivation by small and marginal farmers where they don't have any agreement on paper that's the reality uh, and the government doesn't facilitate uh, you know giving them identity cards and so on which they are supposed to but when the farmer commits to say they come back and say that you know you don't have a written uh, agreement so these are the kind of cause these are the kind of reasons that the government gives uh, to actually push back on the uh, uh, you know uh, push away from uh, providing support to such farmers and uh, through the initiative of uh, uh, raithu swaraj vedika volunteers many such uh, farmers uh, families have actually got support uh, so this is where the advocacy work uh, comes in so in the last 3 uh, two years actually uh, in telangana we have been able to get 700 farmers who said family support from the government uh through this kind of an advocacy effort and uh, in andhra pradesh about 720 farm suicide families just in the last one and a half years you know since the pre- since the 2019 elections in the last one year 720 farm suicide families in andhra pradesh have gotten support through our intervention uh, so uh, if we look at the financial impact of this uh, you know this efforts uh, it's about 6 million dollars uh, worth of support has gone to farm suicide families in telangana and 7.2 million dollars worth of uh support has gone from the government to the farm suicide family so uh, this kind of gives us a, a understanding of the uh, impact that we can have when we actually push the government to do the right thing uh farm suicide families uh, helping farm suicide families is only one issue we'll talk about the other uh, kind of interventions also that make a difference uh, but essentially this is the scale of difference that we can make by supporting let us say five or six activists uh who are working you know around the clock every day of the week uh, uh, uh on such issues uh, we are actually may uh, putting so much pressure on the government uh, that they are forced to uh, provide support to the uh, farmers who are in distress uh, so this is one of the stories that i wanted to uh, share with you and uh, uh, then going on uh, uh, this is the second pillar so the first one is basically helping farmers in distress second uh, part is essentially enhancing the incomes and sustainability uh, so here uh, aid is working on various projects of uh, uh, you know promoting sustainable agriculture organizing women uh, or organizing farmers into collectives so that they can get a better income and so on these are couple of glimpses from other states uh, you know because aid is working on uh, farmers issues in various states so in west bengal we are supporting in sundarbans area in punjab we are supporting khetu vira sat mission uh, to move away from the heavy chemical intensive agriculture Uh, so uh, this is one last video that i would like to show you so this is from anantapur district in అనంతపురం జిల్లా పేరు చెప్పగానే వెంటనే తీవ్ర వర్షాభావం కరవు పరిస్థితులు కంటి ముందు కదలాడతాయి నిత్యం కష్టాల సాగుతో తల్లడిల్లిపోయే ఆ జిల్లాలో వ్యవసాయాన్ని బండగ్గా చేస్తున్నారా మహిళలు వ్యవసాయం చేసి అప్పుల పాలై భర్తలను కోల్పోయిన వారు కొందరైతే భర్త వేధింపులు తాళలేక వేరుపడిన మహిళలు ఇంకొందరు వీరందరినీ ఒక్క చోటకు చేర్చింది రిడ్ సంస్థ పది మంది ఒంటరి మహిళలను ఓ గ్రూపుగా తయారు చేసి వ్యవసాయం చేస్తే తాము అండగా ఉంటామని వారికి భరోసానిచ్చింది సొంత భూమి లేని వారికి అనంతపురం మండలం కురగుంట గ్రామంలో ఎనిమిది ఎకరాలు మరో చోట పన్నెండు ఎకరాలు భూమిని కౌలుకు ఇప్పించింది రిట్ సంస్థ ఏడాదిలో తొమ్మిది నెలల పాటు చేతి నిండా పనితో పాటు రోజువారీ ఆదాయంతో ఇల్లు గడవడం సులభంగా మారిందని ఇప్పుడు ఆ మహిళలు సంతోషం వ్యక్తం చేస్తున్నారు వంతుల వారీగా పొలం పనులు చేసుకుంటూ పంటలు సాగు చేసుకుంటున్నామని మహిళలు చెబుతున్నారు ఒంటరి మహిళమంతా గ్రూప్ అయ్యాం సార్ అంత భర్త లేని వాళ్ళు ఆత్మహత్య వాళ్ళు పది మంది గ్రూప్ అయినాము ఎనిమిది ఎకరాలు కౌలకు తీసుకున్నాం సార్ ఇక్కడ శని వేసినాం సార్ ఇక్కడ వర్షం లేనప్పుడు మేము శని వేసింటే ఈడ రైతులు కూడా కొంతమంది నగినారు సార్ ఇక్కడ వీళ్ళేంది వర్షం లేనప్పుడు శని వేస్తున్నారు వీళ్ళు ఎక్కడ మహిళా రైతులు అనేటట్లు మమ్మల్ని చూసి ఏలనగా మాట్లాడినారు సార్ ఫస్ట్ వాళ్ళ దగ్గరగా మేము కూడా బాగు చేయి చూపి ఇలా ప్రకృతి వ్యవసాయం ఎలా ఉంటుందో రైతులు కూడా ఇది చూసి మమ్మల్ని చూసి ముందు రావాలని ఉత్సాహంతో మేము చాలా దీన్ని ముందుకు పోతున్నాం సార్ అట్లా ఇది ఇరవై నాలుగు పంటలు ఉన్నాయి సార్ ఇక్కడ ఏది ఒక పంట రాకోకుండా ఇంకో పంట వస్తుంది అని రైతులకి మనము చెప్పడానికి ఒక పంటలో నష్టం వచ్చినా ఇంకో పంట మాకు పండించగలము అనే దాంట్లో మాకు ఉంటుంది మమ్మల్ని చూసి ఇంకో రైతు కూడా అలా చేయాలనే ఉద్దేశంతో ఈ పంటలో మేము పది మంది గ్రూప్ అయ్యి చేస్తున్నాము ఇక్కడ వచ్చేసి పది మంది గ్రూప్ లో వచ్చేసి ఇక్కడ ఇరవై నాలుగు రకాలు విత్తనాలన్నీ పెట్టుకున్నాము ఇక్కడ వచ్చేసి కాయగూరలు చౌడేకాయలు గోవాకు 
వంకాయలు టమోటా పచ్చిమిర్చి బెండకాయలు అన్ని పెట్టుకుని మేము తీసుకుంటున్నాము మేము తీసుకుండేది కాక ఇంటికి వాడుకుండేది కాక బయట కూడా తీసుకువెళ్ళి అట్లే మా ఇంటి దగ్గరే బయట కూడా లేదు మా ఇంటి దగ్గర మా వీధిలోనే అందరూ వచ్చి తీసుకుంటుంటారు ఇవి మందు లేని పంట అని వచ్చి తీసుకుంటున్నారు చౌడేకాయలు వచ్చేసి నాకైతే ఇంతవరకు నాలుగు వేలు అట్లా వచ్చేసింది ఇవి మందు లేనివి అని రేటు అని పలికి ఇంటి దగ్గరే తీసుకున్నారు చిరుధాన్యాల ప్రాధాన్యతను ఆ మహిళలకు వివరించారు స్వచ్ఛంద సంస్థ ప్రతినిధులు మార్కెట్ లో డిమాండ్ కు తగ్గట్లుగా ఉత్పత్తి పెంచుకుంటే కలిగే ప్రయోజనాలు వారికి తెలియజేశారు ఏక పంట కాకుండా బహుళ పంటల విధానంతో ముందుకు వెళ్లేలా తక్కువ పెట్టుబడితో గో ఆధారిత వ్యవసాయంపై మహిళలంతా సాగు చేపట్టారు కొర్ర అండుకొర్ర సజ్జా జొన్నలతో పాటు నూనె గింజల పంటలైన వేరుశెనగ నువ్వులు ఆముదం సాగు చేపట్టారు ప్రస్తుతం ఒక్కొక్కటిగా దిగుబడి మొదలయ్యాయి కొద్దిపాటి నీటి సౌకర్యంతో రోజువారీ ఆదాయం వచ్చే గోంగూర పాలకూర గోరు చిక్కుడు వంకాయ తదితర కాయగూరల పంట సాగు చేపట్టామని మహిళలు ఉత్సాహంగా తెలిపారు జీవితంలో అనేక ఇబ్బందులు ఎదుర్కొన్న తమకు రెడ్ సంస్థ అండగా నిలబడిందని మహిళలు సంతోషం వ్యక్తం చేస్తున్నారు yeah so that that's a short clip uh, but actually uh, etv which is the biggest uh, channel in the in telugu uh, television uh, actually did a half an hour program uh, you know about these women farmers uh, so it's a very unique uh, thing where uh, reds which is one of eight partners uh, in anantapur district uh, took this initiative to uh, form these women into a collective and uh, they uh, have been cultivating so there are two or three key things to notice here one is uh that uh, women farmers you know who are uh, these are all single uh, women uh, means uh, you know they they don't have a, a husband either because uh, uh, you know the husband committed suicide or uh, because they have been through harassment and so they have to leave uh, uh, so but they do have children uh, you know and a family to sustain apart from themselves uh, and uh, rather than uh, they uh, they looking at themselves as helpless uh they have actually become empowered because they have formed this collective and they are doing this farming uh secondly they are doing sustainable agriculture with a multi cropping system so in that eight acres of land uh, that they showed us uh, they are growing 24 crops uh, so uh, the thing is even if uh, one or two crops fail the other crops uh, you know would give better yield so they are actually hedging their losses uh, and uh, they uh, also are able to Uh, uh you know get a local market for whatever they are producing uh, apart from their own home consumption because uh, they are cultivating organically and uh, they are producing all these vegetables without uh, and other crops you know without using any chemicals uh, so uh, it's it's a very good economic enterprise that they have started and uh, because of their success uh, they started a couple of years ago because of their success another group of women farmers have also taken up in another course so, so we are hoping that this also becomes a model that can uh spread uh, so uh, uh, actually in anantapur uh, uh, an all women farmers cooperative was formed at a district level now there are 250 women farmers uh, who are part of this uh, cooperative uh, there are three such cooperatives uh, you know that red uh, organization has uh, started so these are some of the initiatives you know where uh, we are uh, getting uh, Uh, you know farmers organized for better incomes and sustainability uh, this is another initiative uh, you know trying to promote millet cultivation as a response to drought in anantapur again uh, so there we also helped in setting up a processing unit um, uh, which was lacking you know local processing unit was lacking so therefore the farmers uh, had actually moved away from millet cultivation now after this pioneering effort which started about uh, uh, 10 years ago now there are so many millet processing units which came up uh, you know across andhra pradesh and now andhra pradesh government itself has a, a big program uh, for supporting millet cultivation and also for establishing such uh, processing units uh, so this is uh, th- these are some of the glimpses of uh, the positive stories you know of how uh, uh, you know farmers are able to Uh, move out of uh, that kind of distress situation uh, so uh, the last part of uh, what i'm talk- going to talk about is going back to making the government work for the farmers uh, like i said you know the impact of actually uh, something that the government does either in terms of implementation of existing policies or making a new policy which uh, gives better support to farmers uh, actually has a very very uh, uh, broad and uh, uh you know long lasting impact uh, on farmers and uh, one of the reasons why farmers are committing suicide is because uh, they feel that the system doesn't care for them 
uh, you know, that basically the country doesn't care for them, uh, even if they're in distress. Uh, so if the system doesn't care, if the government doesn't care, and whichever party comes into power, they don't actually get any support from the government. That is one of the major factors which pushes them into distress. Uh, so when we try to make government responsive uh, to the requirements, to the demands of the farmers, that actually gives them much more strength to cope. Because ultimately, see, life is a struggle uh, for uh, people uh, in the working class anyway. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, this gives them confidence uh, to face that struggle. Uh, so uh, again, a couple of uh, a uh, couple of examples of uh, how we are able to uh, make the government do the right thing uh, without going again into more details. Uh, I had already mentioned that tenant farmers issues is a uh, issue is a major one because uh, increasingly 30 to 50 percent of agriculture in many states, especially Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, is done by tenant farmers. They are not owners of the land, but they have taken the land on lease. Uh, so, in addition to all the other expenditure, they also have to pay a lease rent uh, to the owner uh, but they don't get any recognition in terms of you know being able to go to bank and get a loan or uh, crop insurance or any other support systems so therefore we have been pushing the governments that they should issue a identity card uh, to the tenant farmers so that they also get the government support so in andhra pradesh after our advocacy uh, this year about 2.2 lakh 220000 landless tenant farmers uh, got this, uh, uh, you know, what is called a CCRC card, Cultivator Rights card, uh, and they were included in the Right to Parosa support of the uh, government. Uh, similarly, uh, we've also been working on this whole advocacy on minimum support prices. Uh, so this, for example, is a campaign that we did. Uh, you know, we went to a lot of the agriculture mandis, uh, the markets, and uh, uh, showed how uh, the, uh, the farmers are not getting even the minimum support price which is announced by the farmers. So we made this, uh, you know, we, we, we made this big banners uh, where uh, we asked the farmers to write uh, how much crop they are selling, uh, what is the price that the government announced, what's the real price that they are getting and, uh, and as a result of that how much loss they are making. Uh, so this campaign became a big, I mean, it attracted a lot of visibility. This, for example, was a full, full page article, a front page article uh, in Sakshi newspaper, which was one of the big newspapers. And uh, this kind of a pressure on the government actually uh, pushed the government to intervene and uh, make sure that the farmers get a better price for their produce. So this is part of the fight for a fair price for the farmers. Uh, and another initiative that we have started is the Kisan Mitra helpline. Uh, so this is a helpline that we uh, started in collaboration with the government. So see, our work with the government is not only uh, to demand certain things and uh, or uh, uh, you know do agitations, which we also do. Uh, but wherever possible, wherever there is a uh, opening, uh, we also work with the government, collaborate with them to initiate programs for the farmers' welfare. So this helpline is one such program that we initiated in uh, in Telangana. It is working in three districts of Telangana now, Adilabad, Vikarabad and Manchirial, where we working with the collector's office closely. Uh, and uh, any, So this is declared as an official helpline of the government, of the district government. So they publicize it to all the farmers in the district. Uh, but when somebody calls this helpline, the call is not taken by some, uh, you know, government functionary who may not be interested in actually helping the farmers. The call is taken by our volunteers. Uh, so our team, which is trained in taking these calls, understanding the farmers problems and making note of them, entering them into database and then following up with the district government and with the local officials to make sure that those problems get solved. So that is what the Kisan Mitra helpline is about. So uh, until now, there are more than 13, 14,000 cases uh, which have been handled through this helpline and about 60, 65% of them are resolved. Uh, there are many uh, which are still pending, which we are working on them. Uh, but essentially this kind of a helpline, once again, you know, gives a confidence to the farmer that, you know, if we have a problem, we can go somewhere. Uh, to at least try to get it addressed. So that's the kind of role that this helpline is playing. Uh, there are many examples actually of farmers getting help, uh, you know, through this helpline. This is one such example. Uh, I think, uh, uh, you know, we may be running short of time, so I won't go into too much details, but you can just see the smile, you know, on Malapa's face and uh, his wife's face. When he called our helpline, he basically said that I'm in such deep distress that I'm going to commit suicide. I was actually he said that, you know, I have a bottle of pesticide with me 
and uh, you know i would have committed suicide today but uh, somebody told me uh, that there is this kind of a helpline which is available so why don't you call the helpline and tell them your troubles uh, so he said that, you know if i don't receive any help from you by tomorrow uh, i won't be here uh, so immediately our local volunteers went and visited him uh, also on the phone we tried to understand the problem and uh, we found that it's uh, actually a very interconnected problems you know so uh, you know his the land was in his father's name his father died the land didn't get passed on to his name the revenue officials were making them go in circles you know not uh, transferring the uh, uh, the title to his name meanwhile uh, 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 you know he uh, his borewell was drying up he wanted a drip irrigation system he could not get that so he was losing his entire sugarcane crop you know so through a quick intervention from our kisan mitra team actually we were able to make a difference his crop was saved uh, you know he was able to recover his uh, investment and he is now a happy farmer in karabat so there are many many such cases you know thousands of such cases where uh, we've been able to make a difference uh, so these are some happy fa- farmers faces just want to end uh, by saying that uh, all this work that uh, you know uh, i was just giving a few glimpses of the kind of work that is going on uh is possible because of uh, you know support from various uh, sources like i said you know we uh, try to leverage support from even people who are here uh, you know so that it becomes a local circle uh, local loop uh, you know of support uh, but the help from aid uh, makes a big difference because uh, especially in supporting our core team uh, because uh, you know the team of activists who are working here uh who uh, uh you know travel to the villages who work with the farmers is a very valuable team uh, it, it could be as part of the kisan mitra project or some other uh, initiative that aid is doing to help the farmers in distress uh, so uh, this is the kind of difference that your support can make uh, so i i just want to end with a few figures uh, you know just for you to get a handle on what difference it can make uh, for example uh, we help uh, farmers who said families children you know go to uh, school or college uh, so about 50 dollars per month uh, if you think about uh, that as a contribution uh, can help three children you know go to school from farmers who said families uh, if you look at a 1200 dollars per year uh, can help uh, 10 farmers shift to sustainable agriculture so if you are working in five villages uh, for sustainable agriculture uh, with let's say 150 farmers Uh, uh it requires about $10000 for us to support that project uh so if you uh, support uh, you know with let's say 1000 or 1200 it helps uh, several farmers to shift to sustainable agriculture and uh, $2500 per year would help uh, support a district coordinator uh, so these are kind of differences that uh, you know we can make and i just want to remind uh, our results of the uh, you know gandhi ji's talisman that you know we should think about what support we can give or what difference we can make uh, in the lives of people uh, and uh, it uh, uh, you know uh, it may not solve the entire problem uh, but that should not uh, stop us from uh, doing whatever we can uh, so uh, i would say we should send a collective message to our farmers anna data sukhi bhava uh, people who are producing food for the nation they should actually be living self sufficiently and happily so that's uh, the message of kisan swaraj Uh, and uh, i hope that uh, through our collective efforts uh, we can make a difference in the lives of uh, thousands of more farmers thank you thank you so much kiran um for that presentation it was really eye opening to see such stats and i think it is our duty to help you guys keep up the work that you are trying to uh, to do to support the farmers Today we also have uh, Mrs. Arvinda here with us. She has been associated with AID uh, since 1995 and now serves as one of its development coordinators. Um, she has also been an AID Jeevan Sathi for a long time. Uh, her work involves several social justice issues in India, such as fair trade, environmental monitoring, and fighting for the rights of Khadi garment workers. Um, hello, Arvinda. Over to you. Yes, Rajna. Um, thank you very much, Kiran. Thank you. Seems so inadequate, but um, in the midst of these tough times, we are able to spare an hour to, um, you know, learn about 
learn about farmers who have been shouldering a, a huge share of the burden um, that the world is, is facing. I think this has been a difficult year um, for, for many sectors, and I think the farmers are, are feeling it uh, quite intensely uh, and are also leading the way towards the solutions, uh, as you have described. And you haven't even mentioned that the farmers have actually been out on the streets raising these issues uh, publicly at the highest levels of government, trying to change the policies so that, you know, we can, we can see these solutions, not just in one, or, uh, or one family, but um, throughout the country. And when we hear about somebody like Ashwini, who has a, overcome tremendous obstacles to stay alive, to support her, her mother, to pursue her education, um, and, and aspire for a better tomorrow, it really uh, hits home right to the heart. And, uh, and all of us here on this call, uh, I, uh, you know, I, I can speak for everyone when, when we are really cheering for Ashwini and when we really feel um, a stirring of hope when we hear about somebody like Ashwini uh, persevering in spite of all of this. And to be able to support someone in that time of need is, is really an honor and a privilege. And I see that, um, that several people, uh, several of the aid Ann Arbor volunteers uh, are standing by to, uh, to take uh, the donations. They have put the donate link in the chat uh, window and we'll uh, we'll be talking about that some more. It's basically aidindia.org slash support farmers and uh, I encourage everyone on this call to uh, make a donation now, help us reach our target, help us continue to support this kind of work in India. We'll be taking some of your questions uh, uh, while we keep the, the the pledge drive going along, and I would encourage people if if you if you can share what you're donating um, in the chat window, that will certainly help encourage others. And we would love to thank you on the air, as they say in public radio. So let's um, let's start with a few questions. I would like to ask um, Sohini, uh, can you come online and ask? Uh, uh, you have a, a couple of questions here. Perhaps, um, you know, maybe you can pick your favorite one, or if I can suggest you have a question about how farmers are able to um, reach the market. So, Sohini, could you please uh, unmute and ask your question? Yes, right. Um, yeah, I have a wonderful Turn talk. Turn your video uh, on also, please. Can you hear me? Yeah, but we'd like to see you yes. also. Oh, okay. Let's see if I can find. Where is the video button for me? <laughs> Oh, okay. <laughs> go ahead. It's okay. I just yes. unmuted. So okay, somewhere there'll be a... That's fine. Go ahead. Please, please go ahead. Okay. So, yeah. Thank you so much. This was very educative for me. And um, my my favorite part was seeing, uh, um, you know, farmer, farmer women and their cooperative. That's a very good... Um, that's such an achievement. Like, so many women work in the field but they don't get recognized as farmers. Um, I have two key questions. One is, um, as you are saying, the tenant farmer, right? That means they don't own the land. So was there ever any land reform? Like the thing that happened in West Bengal in most of, most of the cases, as I know, is like at some point of our left-leaning government's um, reign, uh, most of the uh, tenant farmer, you know, kind of became the owner of at least some part of the lands. So that kind of land reform, did it happen in other part of India? Maybe I'm, I'm, I don't know uh, many things, so I would like to know that if you know. Yeah, yeah, definitely. So uh, I think the in terms of giving land to the tenant farmers, uh, I think uh, what happened in West Bengal was the best case scenario uh, uh, can, compared to the other parts of India. Uh, even in West Bengal also, there were many issues uh, still, you know, outstanding issues with uh, tenant farmers getting land. But at least, uh, you know, a whole set of Batai Dar Kisan, they uh, got access to land. The land was not transferred to them as a ownership, uh, but uh, they basically got a long-term lease and, uh, you know, their name was also in the Pata as a leaseholder not as an owner of the land. Uh, so the, the Bargadar uh, kind of a campaign which the CPM government had done uh, in the 70s and 80s, that was that made a lot of impact. Uh, in other states, uh, you know, the situation is very, uh, uh, you know, uh, 
uh, it, it, it's very different in different states but uh, in most of the states the situation is that the tenant farmers did not actually get uh, rights to the land either leaseholder rights or the ownership rights uh, and uh, uh, so what it meant is that actually many of the people who were landless in the 60s and 70s continued to be landless so that is one impact the other thing which is happening now in the last 10 to 15 years is that there is a new class of lease uh, holding farmers which are who are being created because uh, you know all the small and marginal farmers who have just one or two acres of land uh, that uh, land is actually not sufficient for them to uh, get enough income to support the entire family which means that they need to actually uh, get another three or four acres of land but land has become so costly that uh, you know farmers are not in a position to buy land actually it is the people who are in other sectors uh, uh, you know doing other jobs or business and so on who are the only ones who are in a position to buy land so actually a lot of land is owned by people who are not doing farming uh, but their land is being cultivated by the leaseholder. So in the last 10 to 15 years, actually, there's a tremendous increase in the number of farmers who are taking other people's land on lease. And uh, our fight has been that all these uh, farmers should get recognized as leaseholders, as cultivators, uh, so that at least whatever the... Uh, so we are not... Uh, even the even the people who are leasing the land, they are not saying that, you know, in five years from now, I want to become the owner of this land. They are saying at least recognize me as a cultivator of this land, uh, so that when there is a crop insurance, when there is a bank loan, when there is a all that disaster calamity, they should get it, but uh, they are not getting it. Unfortunately, in most of the states, uh, the tenant farmers are not recognized, and uh, at least in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, there is a law which requires the government to do it, but they are not implementing it properly. In most of the other states, there is not even a law which actually requires them to recognize. And then another question was um, local marketing. Uh, so is there an effort, like you talked about Swaraj, right? So does, does is there an effort from, do you see a merit into, um, you know, farmers selling their produce more locally than trying to depend on government, you know, government or FCI to buy every year, like Punjab farmers does. So less dependence on government. Uh, yeah, see, I mean, there are two aspects to this. One is that uh, definitely local markets uh, are definitely better. Uh, and if the farmers are able to sell uh, their produce uh, to local consumers, it's better, especially in terms of, you know, when we are talking about uh, people growing millets, people growing diverse crops, people growing organic vegetables and so on. Right. Uh, we do not want the farmers to go through all the trouble of producing organic uh, vegetables only to sell uh, them to somebody who is living in Bombay or Bangalore right. uh, to consume. They should also be consuming it locally. Their neighbors should be consuming. See, that is what we heard from the Anantapur ladies that actually people in their street, other farmers are coming and buying. So that is what we would like to see happen and which we are encouraging in wherever we are working on the ground you know whether on millets and uh, or, or organic uh, uh, you know vegetables and so on but there is also a role of the government in uh, making sure that the markets function well for the farmers uh, so uh, th that is where i think this whole recent agitation about uh, you know the government uh, trying to withdraw from their responsibility. So the, re, the last three acts which the government has made is basically the government trying to withdraw from their responsibility of making the markets fair uh, for the farmers. And they are saying that, you know, uh, we are giving freedom to the corporates and agribusiness to uh, purchase without any kind of a scrutiny or regulation from the government. So they're giving a lot of freedom from regulation uh, for the, uh, you know, for the corporates and agribusiness. Uh, which uh, actually is not in the interest of the farmers. Uh, farmers need that the uh, uh, the markets need to be regulated in a way that there is a fair play in the market, uh, uh, where there is the small and marginal farmers get a bargaining space uh, that they are not actually crowded out by big players who then start uh, you know completely controlling the market uh, right. because uh, in, in in the US and other places basically yes, it is right. a, a monopoly or a duopoly basically just uh, you know three or four companies controlling the entire market so that is certainly not in the interest of the farmers so that is what actually they are fighting for so I, I'm just saying that you know local market we support but at the same time we are saying that the government should play its role we don't want the right. government to actually step back from its role makes sense.
I have one more. Should I ask or I I'll, wait for I'll, other people? I'll, I'll come back to you, Sohini, because we do okay, have a you. number of questions. But thanks for getting the discussion off to a rousing start. Uh, you know, in aid, we, we say that, you know, uh, we respond both um, dilse and dimagse with our hearts and with our brains or with our minds. And we can see with, uh, you know, Kisan Mitra Helpline, you know, with our phones or with the ground level team like Kondal and, and uh, others, you know, with our whole bodies, with our legs, going and meeting people where they are, going to meet uh, the, the, the public officials, finding out the answers to people's questions. I mean, think, think, of, uh, think of Malapa. I mean, it, we wouldn't have seen the picture of his, of his smiling face if, if somebody hadn't been there to answer the phone, if sudden, somebody hadn't been there to look up, you know, what is this problem? What is this pest? How do we solve this problem? And so people are putting their, their heart, soul, minds, legs, everything in to bringing that smile back and, and making, uh, making our hearts, uh, you know, sing the way, uh, the way, you know, we heard at the beginning of this message. We respond to stories like, like Ashwini's or like Manlapa's with our hearts, but it takes so much more to make this, um, to, you know, to keep all of this happening, to, to make the connections between the policy, uh, you know, the economics of it, the, the, the agri just the agricultural science involved, um, you know, just recognize that you know for someone to just have their basic needs met in life to have a house you know to have uh, you know food clothing shelter education these are these are basic needs these are not luxuries so if somebody goes into debt for for, for one of those things that is also part of the agrarian crisis it you know it, it, this it, we can make sense to us but to make it make sense where it counts it takes all of this legwork all of these activists to to make people listen and to make um, to make the policy listen, and that's so that it is able to to give because we're connected with with all of these grassroots organizations. So I just want to give everybody an exciting update. We do have a target of ten thousand dollars in today's call, and we have reached one thousand dollars thanks to six generous donors who have uh, who have started the process. And we would like to encourage more people to uh, to donate. I think um, we have the donate link on the screen. Oh, thank you so much for your pledge, uh, Sohinidi. And I would like to remind people that um, if your company matches your donation, um, you know, please, please tell us that as well. If, uh, if you, if you have, you know, we, we can definitely, um, I mean, I suppose you have to follow up on that, but we will uh, make sure that that is credited to today's uh, donation total. And uh, I would also like to um, liven things up on, on the chat uh, because we have an auction today. We have two paintings that, um, that have been generously donated by another partner uh, in, in Kerala. So Benil, would you um, please introduce us Thank to um, the paintings that we have today from our partners in uh, Snehi Bhavan. The artist is KJ Matthews. And um, Benil, can you just tell us a bit about these paintings that will be available for auction? And you can bid on the paintings in the chat. Benil? He's been in there. Benil. Uh, meanwhile, if Srijana, if you can show us uh, each painting individually, people can have can have a look at them. It's a it's a Dalit artist in Kerala who uh, you know has actually started along um, you know is, along with his wife has started a home uh, for Dalit and tribal youth uh, who are in difficult circumstances to be able to uh, have shelter pursue their education and um, he is kind of given an expression to uh, the plight, uh, the, the, the intertwined nature of the problems that uh, the people are facing. So I believe the title of, the, of oh, the, the first painting, the title is actually Intertwined. Can you show us Intertwined again, please? Can you hear me, Arunda? Uh, now we can hear you, Benil. Benil, please just uh, tell us a bit about the two paintings and uh, we'll start the bidding. Yeah, so these Paintings were made by an artist, uh, Mr. Matthews. Uh, he and his wife, 
they run a home shelter home for uh, tribal and dalit girls who are uh, basically like abandoned or who are in underprivileged situation it's it's a home in kerala so he uses this the, the proceeds from the the sale of this paintings will go in helping uh, supporting the the girls education and uh, help them train in occasional courses um, yeah so please okay. so uh, this is called entwined so this is called survivors so oh, his yes his paintings are inspired by the lives and the struggles of the the oppressed communities um, so that's why you can see them uh, in the in the pictures this is okay. called survivors and the second one is called entwined entwined all right so and uh, so if you uh, the bidding starts at $300 and uh, please uh, make your pledge make your bids in the chat window and um, we will go on to the next question meanwhile don't forget uh, that we are um, trying to reach our goal today uh, to uh, support farmers so the donate link is aidindia.org slash support farmers so I would like to ask Suresh to um, unmute and uh, please ask your question regarding um, the marketing support for farmers Suresh I don't see Suresh actually so um, let's see, Chaitanya, are you there? Yes, Chaitanya. Uh, yes, Chaitanya, hi. can you uh, unmute yeah. and ask your question? Yeah, I, I can hear. Mm -hmm. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, yeah, I'm just looking. You're asking for the bidding, right? Chaitanya, did you have a have a question about uh, farm inputs? Uh, no, I don't have any question. I just put my uh, one suggestion uh, to Dr. Kiran Vissa. So mm -hmm. hopefully he got to this uh, comment. So basically, I, Dr. Vissa, I just want to explain something. Uh, Usually, uh, the farmers getting all the things uh, on the retail price, like fertilizers and everything, seeds and everything. But at the end of the day, when he going to the sell our their crops, that will government taken and public taken on the wholesale price. That is a huge difference. Who make them too much poor and day by day. So we can also work on this point. Uh, but I don't know too much about all the things. But I think this is a major concern about this. Yeah, exactly. So uh, I think we need to work on two fronts. One is uh, trying to reduce the cost of cultivation uh, so right. that they don't uh, depend too much on buying pesticides and fertilizers from the market, mm -hmm. especially the chemical fertilizers and chemical pesticides, mm -hmm. uh, because a lot of agriculture can be done based on local resources, you know, like those women uh, have shown. Uh, so uh, I think moving away from a very high input agriculture so that the input costs are reduced. Uh, but uh, even then, uh, they need to get a fair price for their produce. And like you said, you know, their produce is always sold at, uh, in wholesale and, uh, you know, they have to buy at retail. So they are always at a uh, disadvantage uh, in generally uh, in the market. So therefore, they need a, uh, you know, fair market uh, to be functioning for the farmers. So do you, uh, do you think uh, this, I think currently we are listening too much about the new amendment bill from the Indian government, mm -hmm. so just also trying to do the same thing, uh, something like that. The industry directly can approach the farmers and something. Is that really happens or, or really but, affects the, our farmers or no? Uh, no, actually, see, the thing is, uh, uh, I mean, I, I again, I don't want to get into too much of a policy discussion, but our understanding, you know, from the farmers' organizations is that. Mm -hmm. Uh, these three bills which the government has brought in, they are more for the benefit of the industry and for the agribusiness than for the farmers. Yeah, I think uh, so. Because yeah. it actually doesn't give any new advantage to the farmers. See, farmers already have a freedom uh, yeah. to sell to whoever they want to. So it's not that the farmers don't have the freedom. Uh, so existing laws 
already give farmers freedom to sell wherever they want to, mm-hmm. uh, to whoever they want to. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, so it is just a wrong uh, notion or a wrong propaganda that actually now farmers don't have freedom. Some new freedom is being given. It's not being given. Yeah, exactly. Uh, but the uh, you know the companies and the industry agribusiness is being given freedom uh, to buy outside any regulate regulation. Uh, so uh, you know now under the new law, they can purchase from the farmers, but not subject to any regulation or any paying any market cess to the government. Uh, so that actually, uh, I mean, our, our apprehension is that this essentially destroys the regulated markets which the farmers already uh, have, you know, which are actually helping the farmers. Uh, so therefore, they are m- much more likely to be subject to exploitation, uh, uh, you know, outside the regulated market. So this is basically the concern of the farmers. Yeah. And, and we have seen that happening in the US, right? So basically in the US, what has happened in the last 40, 50 years is that many of the family farms what are called as family farms or small farmers yeah, yeah, have been yeah. systematically pushed out of agriculture basically because agribusiness uh, corporations have taken over the whole uh, value chain you know right from providing seeds to the farmers to uh, buying it from them and then actually all the way up to the retail chain you know processing industry and the retail chain and so on is all under a few agribusiness corporations uh, so in the process, what happens is that you know the, uh, a single farmer or a family farm finds it very difficult to sustain. Uh, therefore, their margins are cut, and uh, the margins of the agribusiness are increased. So what we need is the farmer's margin should increase, uh, which means that they should get a better share of the entire value chain. You know, from the production to the retail, more of the value chain should be under the control of the farmers, which is uh, actually these bills are going in the opposite direction. Uh, but uh, Mr. Actually, uh, I am also from the farmer background. Even uh, right now, the till date, we uh, my family is still doing the farming business and everything. I remember when I was used to do the farming and agriculture and everything, and then go to the market. We used to call uh, mandi, yeah, mandi system in the local. System. So we used to sell our products to who are local local people in nearby, like you and everyone. He's come to mm-hmm. and we bargain to each other. But mm-hmm. basically, problem what I always see at that time. Uh, we always pay uh, some um, uh, some big amount of money who the who taking care of the mandi and everything. Mm-hmm. And those person only uh, those person are always used to fix our prices. Now, what do you big, say? Uh, those person who is taking care of the mandi and who is a stakeholder of the mandi, they are fixing our prices. You cannot mm-hmm. sell more than that. You cannot sell less than that. Mm-hmm. So this is another thing we cannot directly approach to the public who are actual buyers of our products, and uh, because there are so many of the stakeholders in between uh, between farmers like us and some other uh, other people who are the buyers like the common people as well. So this is yeah. another yeah yeah see. Yeah, yeah. See, like I said, you know, it's a, it's a complex issue, but uh, uh, what uh, I mean the the, the the thing is that the reality at the ground level is that at this point, you know, especially with a lot of changes which have come in the last 20 years, there are actually no restrictions on farmers in selling to whoever they want to, even if uh, they want to sell directly to, let's say, you know, a farmer in Anantapur, uh, the farmers that we're talking about in Anantapur, right? So if they want to sell their uh, bajra uh, to some person who's sitting in Bangalore, there's no restriction actually in them doing that. They can do it. The only thing is that uh, most farmers actually cannot go that far and sell. You know, they cannot make those uh, you know long distance contacts and sell. Uh, and uh, what is actually required is that you know whatever they can sell locally uh, within the the mandi that is accessible to them, that should be uh, regulated so that the uh, you know the farmers are not exploited. This is the only thing that the that marketplace is actually providing. Once you take that away. Then what happens is that they are actually much more likely to be open to exploitation. I just uh, want to give an exciting update. We have crossed two thousand dollars, and I have a number of people to thank. Many of these are actually very, very touching. That have been able to, um, you know, pledge uh, today. We have. Um, we ha- uh, thank you very much to Prahlad, Siddhant, Ramarao, Padma, Prasad, Sai Prakash, Anirudh, Sohini, Suresh, Srijana, Ravi, Benil, Jana, Pikash, and Naga. Um, so that we really appreciate your donation. Oh, and I have a couple of bids to report. 
Um, oh, I see the bidding has been going on. Okay, so Vaishani bid 350 for the survivor's painting, but she has already been outbid by Benil at 450. So um, there, that's uh, the survivor's painting already has two bids, um, and Twined is still um, at the starting bid of $300. So um, please, please continue with that. Um, we will be going to another question. Um, P. Rangan, is that Prahalad? Um, would you uh, like to ask your question while we continue the, um, the bidding as we try to reach our target? We have, uh, you know, we have about 15 more minutes for Q&A before we start wrapping up the session, and we will try to get to all the questions that we've received so far, and we hope that we can reach our target uh, in that time as well. So please um, think about how you can connect and how you can, you know, how you can make a pledge at this critical time. We don't have events, as you know, because of, um, because of the pandemic. So Aid Ann Arbor and Aid Detroit, who are jointly organizing today's program, are really counting on you today to donate as much as, as you can to help continue this work and, um, and connect with the farmers in India. So um, Prahalad, would you like um, to ask your question regarding uh, recycling agricultural waste. Sure, thank you. Uh, nice to meet you. Nice to see you, Kiran, again. Uh, just a general yeah, question that. about um, uh, the impact of uh, possibly innovation or technology on improving um, farm practices or uh, improving the rural economy. I mean, are there any initiatives like this going on and uh, are they making any impact? Uh, just your general thoughts on that. Yeah, so so uh, see, certainly I think a lot of technological innovation can help farmers, uh, especially small and marginal farmers. The only thing is it has to be uh, targeted to their situation. I mean, it should be something which is adaptable uh, by the small marginal farmers. And uh, we are actually also working on some of this technology. So one uh, example is the uh, on the processing side, you know, once, uh, pro, once, the, once the raw pro, uh, crop uh, is harvested, it has to go through some primary processing and secondary processing uh, to get to a, uh, you know, a point where a consumer can use them, right? Uh, so uh, at this point, a lot of that is in the hands of the industry, but actually it can be in the hands of farmers cooperatives. Uh, so this is the direction in which we are working. So like the millet processing units that I talked about, uh, that's actually a new uh, technology uh, uh, which was not earlier available, uh, which is being adapted for millets. Uh, so uh, we have something called a millet machines and tools, which uh, like a partnership company that we established. So where uh, we are developing actually new machines and tools uh, for uh, for the, on the processing side. Uh, through the same uh, firm, uh, we are also developing some technology for the uh, for the actual which will help in the actual cultivation. For example, a uh, uh, solar uh, e-cart uh, has been developed. So one of our Satis who is working on this is Peter Bakos. Uh, you may know him, right, Pralat? Uh, so he, he's actually been working uh, on many innovations like this. Uh, so something uh, called an energy cart, uh, which can uh, actually uh, be run either as on solar or through a manual uh, kind of a powering. Uh, and uh, which can uh, actually simplify many tasks in terms of the uh, you know things which are done in the field. Uh, so both on the processing side and uh, you know what can be done on the field, uh, I think there is there's a lot of scope for new technology to be developed, new sustainable technology. For sure, uh, I will connect with you offline just to follow up on this. Thank you. Though. Yeah, 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 definitely, definitely. Thank yeah, you. so I just Thank wanted you. to say that anybody who is actually interested or who has, uh, uh, you know, links uh, which can help in, uh, uh, in let us say, you know, establishing some processing units or establishing some fabrication units for machines, uh, people who know such uh, companies which are already doing some work in India, you can help uh, link us up with them. Uh, so it will definitely help. Yeah, actually, I. Um... The San Diego chapter was, was recently talking about this. They had a they had a talk with um, with Peter Bekos directly. Mm -hmm. 
-hmm. Yeah. So, um, you know, uh, there are uh, a number of people who were really moved by Ashwini's story and are asking, you know, how, how people can support uh, students like that who need, who need support in, immediately. Like, what is the best way for people who want to make that kind of uh, direct connection to support, um, to support students in need? See, I think being in the U.S., I think donating to aid and uh, aid does, uh, uh, you know, support uh, several of the students of pharmaceutical families. So every year we have a project, you know, whereby we, uh, you know, through, through aid support, we actually reach out and help uh, several pharmaceutical families. Uh, you know, about 100 pharmaceutical families are helped uh, through aid support every year. So uh, you can direct your donation to go towards that kind of a support. So it happens through three or four different organizations in AP and Telangana. There is an organization called Pilipu, there is RDSS, and there is a Center for Sustainable Agriculture. Uh, so that is one direct way in which you can do. Uh, but in addition, if you want to actually follow up with us uh, to even keep in touch with some families and so on that also we can facilitate i mean if you get in touch with me or other people in our team uh, then we can actually facilitate for people to be in touch in fact one of the uh, interesting initiatives which we started is uh, something called a mentorship program uh, so in addition to providing some financial support to uh, you know for them to go to college and so on uh, we also find that these, uh, you know, children who are now, uh, you know, becoming young adults or, uh, uh, you know, uh, adults, uh, they now have to make career choices. They need to uh, decide on what to do. And having gone through such a tragedy in their family, uh, so they need some kind of a counseling to actually uh, face the situation. So uh, we actually have this kind of a mentorship uh, program where uh, each uh, uh, person who signs up to be a mentor uh, gets linked to uh, one or two such uh, young uh, persons from those families and they keep reg in regular touch with them, you know, like every month uh, having a phone call or a visit and so on. So there's a whole group of people in Hyderabad who are doing that kind of a mentorship and uh, more people are welcome to join that, you know, even from the U.S. So even people from the U.S. could, uh, you know, have a big sort of like a big brother or big sister to somebody. Yeah, 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 yeah definitely. Okay, I think that, that that's something that a number of people would uh, definitely be interested in. Uh, and, and Padma, if you would like to unmute, I see that you have, uh, you, I know you were one of the people who asked this question earlier. So I just asked on your behalf. Um, hi. Um, hi, Arvinda. Yes. And uh, basically, um, what I want, uh, the reason why I asked that question is uh, a lot of us, um, uh, go to the aid and uh, donate directly there. But uh, there are a bunch of people who like to have that direct kind of connection where they feel that uh, they see where uh, the resources they're contributing is going directly uh, and affecting somebody's life in a positive way. And that gives them a better sense of uh, satisfaction than just uh, contributing to a general pool of uh, funds. So uh, if there is a way for uh, um, links to be there, uh, I, I haven't recently gone to the aid website and I'm sorry about that. So um, no, it may. I'm really, yeah, I'm really glad you asked the question and I see that you would like to join the mentorship program. So are you in yes. uh, Ann Arbor or Detroit? No, um, I live in Texas. Uh, I'm in yeah. Abilene, uh, Texas. Okay, well, um, please um, put your, you know, put your email uh, in the chat. And um, I'm wondering if, you know, we would love to help you connect through this mentorship program, but I'm wondering if you can help us uh, make this a program that we can, you know, make open to more people um, in sure. the US um, as well. I, would you have I some would, time to volunteer? For that? Yes, okay. I would definitely like to do that. And um, let me put in my email address here, Arvinda. Okay. Uh, go ahead and send me the information and I can call call you up and uh, sure. chat with you as well and Kiran and um, um, because um, uh, I think a lot of times what happens is uh, um, people do come to know uh, those that are here about uh, uh, organizations in India and uh, but there's no uh, personal connect for them. Yeah. So uh, they feel okay. It's it's one more thing that we can contribute from here, and they may send 
once in a while uh, some amount of money but uh, there's no personal connect and uh, there's no direct uh, um uh, uh, i don't know um, that incentive for them to look and see oh this is where i've made a difference in somebody's life so let me continue on uh, and do more of this or help uh, um um reach out to my friends and tell them as well so i think to get that emotional connect happening uh, in the process of uh, contributing to something in india maybe it will be nice if this this mentorship program or uh, if there's a direct link to somebody's um, family or some goal so let's, let's work on that yeah i will yeah. i'll be in touch with you and uh okay. yeah i certainly appreciate the question uh i'd also like to emphasize that um you know because aid is in connection with um these grassroots organizations even you know let's say you know you're somebody who who donates um you know who donates today or who whenever you can you you donate aid is in a position to put that contribution to the best use because we are in we are in direct collaboration with the people working at the last mile in the villages where uh the farmers are are you know reaching out with these kinds of issues with any number of issues it could be related to health education you know crop failure anything that affects the farmers there are organizations right there in in their villages in their districts and aid is in in connection through Kisan Mitra helpline through the Mahila Kisan network through through a number of these organizations and under the umbrella of the Raitu Swaraj Vedika so uh because of our connections all the way to the last mile you can be sure that even even if you don't know whose face you're putting a smile on your contribution goes directly to absolutely to somebody absolutely. you know you it's it's wonderful if you can have that personal connection but i guarantee you even if you don't that personal connection it's like a link in the chain you connect to aid aid connects to a district coordinator that coordinator connects to someone at the village level yes. who you know who is actually you know there in time of need and uh and 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 makes this happen and that's the that is really w- the purpose of aid that is our mission and that's what we've been able to you know build that build that trust and build those grassroots links links over all these years that make it possible for us to do that. So I need to thank a few more people. Um I mean thank you of course Padma for for bringing that up and uh, I'll be in touch with you to make that happen. Chaitanya uh, has also made a a contribution. I, I there was somebody else um Uh, yeah vinayak thank you very much for your contribution as well so uh i think so i i, I mean i want to just add something on that uh, yeah yes, thank please. you padma but yeah yeah padma is also my cousin and uh, oh. thanks padma <laughs> for bringing it up the thing is that uh, no i i think if you can coordinate uh, like arvind was suggesting uh this kind of a mentorship uh, kind of a relationship uh, you know with volunteers in the us we actually initiated that uh, in hyderabad and there are a couple of people uh, who are coordinating it in fact who also are people who return from the us and uh, who are based in hyderabad so they uh, i think if this network can be ex- uh, expanded uh, to people who are now based in the us and they can also play that kind of role i think that's very much welcome uh the other thing i wanted to say is that uh see apart from uh, being in touch with individual farmer families right who are in distress uh it will also be good if uh, people uh, there are in touch with uh, some individual activists activists or you know members of our group so what happens is that uh, you know now now we have actually a very uh, quite a wide network of uh, people you know at least 20 members in our core group uh who are uh, working you know day in and day out on these issues and uh, uh, myself being a connecting point uh, you know between aid and this whole work uh, itself is actually un- insufficient uh, so uh, i think some of the supporters uh, uh, donors uh, also if they would like to be in touch with let us say uh, one activist like kondal or uh, like harsha i think harsha is one of the persons who even joined this call he is also based in hyderabad he is the coordinator of kisan mitra uh, so you, if you are also in touch with one or two activists who are working on the ground here then they can actually share uh, much more uh, you know live uh, richer stories uh, updates on what is happening on the ground and so on so that is also another way of uh, 
uh, I think supporters in the US having a, a live link to what is happening in India. And and I totally agree with uh, Padma that uh, uh, you know while while people do have confidence that aid uh, and the donation that they make to aid goes to the right cause, uh, but uh, I think the, having the emotional connect or you know some direct connect and direct updates and so on does make a lot of difference. So we have to find ways to do. Yeah, thanks, uh, Kiran. We're uh, running uh, close to uh, time, but we have a few more questions. So if I can ask uh, the next, uh, you know, the, I'll try to get as many as I can. So I'm just asking both the person asking and, uh, you know, to be brief. I think our, um, our, we are still, you know, slightly above the 2000 mark. Uh, we're hoping to get to 10,000 by the end of today. So please think deep and dig deep if you can to help us reach our target. Um, Shreya, uh, would you like to ask your question about agricultural universities? Please unmute and if possible, let us see you. Hi everyone. Um, hey. So um, I was, um, uh, I'm based in Virginia Tech now. So I, I've been a part of Bla Blacksburg chapter. So um, thank you for your presentation. It was very informative and I really like the videos that you incorporated in between it really gave, gave us a very like realistic feel of what is happening on the ground so uh, my one of one of my um, like it's not a question but an idea so uh, that uh, i have been in agriculture university so i saw that uh, sometimes there is a relationship that is being forced by the local com like uh, by the university or like uh, that grows between the university professors and um, the local farmers. And uh, because uh, the agriculture, so in India, um, we, the last six months of agriculture, we are supposed to go and stay with the farmer families and go and pay visits. And that's the, that's the way the university gets uh, in touch with the local farmers. So I was wondering if we can um, reap some, benefits from that relationship in terms of uh, innovative technologies that are coming up and uh, and another thing is um, like like as an uh, so another thing is about the processing unit so um, there are a couple of times we have seen that our farmers have surplus production and they don't have a market so uh, to sell them for so in those cases if we have a processing unit which is run by like the local farmers together, then we can actually go ahead and save uh, those, like like I have seen pictures in the newspapers, like they're damaging their crops because they're not getting any price. So instead of damaging their crops, they can actually go ahead and uh, do some processing like jam, jelly and all those things and sell it. Like it increases the shelf life of that crop actually. So yeah. those so, are the so ideas. Yeah, definitely. See, definitely, a lot of uh, scope uh, for doing things on the processing front, especially like you said, you know, something which is set up by farmers' cooperatives. Uh, of course, there are big companies which want to invest in, uh, you know, big processing units and so on. So that will happen. Uh, you know, that's a larger economic process that happens. Uh, but uh, cooperatives that we are forming, right? Uh, so, like for example, organizations in our network themselves would be involved in at least, uh, I think, 40 to 50 different farmers cooperatives. Uh, so in each of those cases, depending on the crops that they are uh, cultivating, uh, they are in the process of establishing processing units, especially small scale processing units, which can be run by a cooperative of, let us say, 100 farmers or 500 farmers, mm -hmm. uh, right? Then what happens is that they have a better leverage on, uh, 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 you know, on when to uh, sell their final produce and so on. And, uh, and uh, uh, so that def that's definitely very valuable. Uh, the only thing is that it also requires a lot of financing and uh, managing a business, uh, right? Yeah. Uh, which is yeah. different from what every individual farmer does, which is basically, you know, produce, harvest, sell. Uh, so that, that, that transition into actually being able to run a business as a cooperative is a challenge, which is what we are facing and, you know, trying to solve. And uh, with respect to, you know, Virginia Tech and other agricultural universities, uh, so are you saying that, um, you know, so let us say Virginia Tech uh, uh, students who are working in agriculture or agriculture technology uh, would be interested in doing a six-month internship in India? 
no 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 or are you saying are you talking about the agriculture colleges or universities in india in india so i have been an agricultural yeah. student in india so uh, okay. i've been uh, so in bckv i used to study my research work was on there so um i okay. also studied in elabad agriculture university so in our program we have this last 6 months as the engineering students have to go for internship so our sort of course was like the last 6 months and it's pretty much the same for all the agricultural programs in india bsc agriculture programs in india that right. last 6 months they have to go for our uh, rawi we call it or roi uh, and that is rural awareness work experience so where right. we have to go and visit the farmers and try to learn from them and so i'm just trying to find out so later on when i was into research with one of the state agriculture universities in west bengal i found that um, so the, they already have a relationship with the uh, local farmers which are farming uh, beyond the uh, university areas like already they have this university owned lands where the farmers farm but it's beyond that so um, I was. Just I, I understand your question. No, I, I was just clarifying whether you are talking about the Indian universities or the US yeah, universities. Yeah, Indian. Universities. Yeah, definitely with the Indian universities. Uh, I mean, we do have say some students coming and working, but uh, generally uh, we have not had uh, uh, you know BSc agriculture students uh, coming and working with us that much. Maybe I think in this, uh, uh, as far as I know, you know, in Andhra Pradesh and Telangana, that kind of a six-month internship doesn't seem to be the norm. Uh, okay. what we find is that only some students who are more interested in actually getting a field experience and genuine field experience and so on actually reach out to organizations like us it's not a regular part of their uh, program uh, okay. but yeah but it's a good uh, thing we will explore uh, that kind of a thing also okay thank you thanks um so i'm going to just have two more questions i know we also have uh one of the young members of uh, a detroit to uh give us a song to close us out so i um will ask uh benil uh to go ahead and ask your question on uh, farmer producer organizations hi kiran uh, i think you touched upon this the farmers cooperatives my question was how successful are the farmer producer organization across india are there any uh, learnings from ap and telangana uh, specifically on that let's see farmer producer organizations see there are certainly some successful farmer producer organizations and we uh, i mean some of them are uh, even have been started by organizations that we work with some of them are uh, you know uh, other organizations that we know uh, so certainly there are successes certainly there is a lot of potential right i think that much can be said Uh, but there are also a lot of challenges so it's not that you know every farmer producer organization uh, which is registered uh, uh, you know can become viable uh, so lot of uh, uh, you know lot of things need to go on in terms of actually uh, building up the capacities of the farmers to run that kind of a cooperative or run an npo or make it a successful business and so on and uh, this is where again the role of the government and the kind of support systems that they provide that does become very important uh so for example uh, right now uh, the good thing is that the fpo uh, farm producer organization has become a buzzword and has become something which is of a priority to governments like for example andhra pradesh government declared that we'll start 1000 fpos and they started you know registering uh, but uh, the thing is uh, and the indian government uh, declared 10000 fpos in 3 years and they've started registering nabard does it and so on Uh, but the thing is if they uh, look at it only as a number game that you know that we have registered 1000 fpos it doesn't mean anything in fact i think registering too many fpos in a shorter period of time uh, is just a, uh, you know uh, 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 just makes it a more of a cause for failure uh, because you are not setting the right norm uh, you are basically saying that uh, the government is interested in starting fpos but not sustaining them Uh, so i would like to see the government or government agencies or nabard or any of these people uh, to start fewer fpos but actually invest more uh, in making them uh, helping them become successful then that becomes a model which will automatically draw more people more farmers into such fpos uh, i hope that answers it yeah thanks kiran 
Thanks uh, again, everybody. We, before we go to the last question and then the, the song to, uh, to take us out, I want to give an update on the state of the auctions. So right now, I think I, I see that Ben and you are the, the leading bidder for the survivor, survivor painting. Can we see Survivor? survivor. Um, so it's at uh, $450. So this is a uh, final call. Okay, um, somebody help me. The one that's showing up right now is called Entwined. Is that correct? This is the survivor one. Oh, sorry. This is okay. Survivor. okay, so this is survivor. Uh, the, the, the bidding is now at $450. So if anybody um, is interested in outbidding Benil Anton, now is the time. And if we could look at Entwined one more time, you have a chance to um, bid on Entwined at the opening bid of $300. And um, these are large paintings. They're uh, four feet by five feet, so they would... Um, you know, form a nice centerpiece in a uh, living room or family room area. And uh, aid Detroit volunteers will see that it's delivered carefully uh, to your home if you are the winner of the painting. If, um, if Benil <laughs> is the winner of the painting, then I guess um, they'll have a party in aid Ann Arbor uh, with the time they have saved from shipping the painting. So we will find out. And uh, now, um, Sohini, I will give you one more time to ask a quick question. The final question. See, one thing I just wanted to say, I mean, yes, go ahead, the, uh, you know, with respect to the donations, yeah. uh, I, I, I do think that if uh, people uh, think in terms of a monthly contribution, uh, yeah. that may actually be helpful because uh, you know, everybody is not in a position to make a larger uh, commitment and so on, you know, especially with these uncertain times and all that. But if people can think in terms of a monthly contribution, whatever they can uh, afford, uh, but make it really monthly. Uh, so uh, I think they can sign up uh, even using their credit card or some other means, right? Bank account and so on. Uh, like yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah. So th that may be actually a better way of contributing. That's, that is very, yeah, that's, uh, a that's a very good point because it, it it's also provides a more reliable source of funds uh, at our end to know that, you know, this is an amount that is going to come in every month. We don't have to keep coming back um, and asking people. And it's probably a lot easier, um, you know, for, uh, for the donor also to think of not, you know, how much they can just afford on a monthly level. So to, to remind you of how, what your contribution can make possible at a $50 per month level, um, you would be in a position to help three children from families affected by farm suicide uh, to go to college. Imagine just for $50 a month being able to make that kind of a difference in three young people's lives. For $1,200 per year, or in other words, $100 a month, um, that would enable 10 farmers to shift to sustainable agriculture and make it less likely that they go into a uh, distressed situation in the first place. If you recall the examples uh, of, the, of the women um, engaging in multi-crop farming and other, other techniques that were more sustainable and less prone to debt and distress, that is the kind of farming that could be supported at the $100 a month level. So some of you who have donated $100 today, um, if you're in a position to consider making that monthly or even quarterly, um, that's something that could go a long way. And if you're in a position to, to go a little higher, like $200 a month or uh, so, um, that would actually help support a district coordinator of, of the Kisan Mitra helpline. And just to think how, what a crucial difference it made to be on the other end of the phone when a farmer like Malapa made that phone call and to have a network of people ready to go and find out whatever it takes to help solve that problem and bring that solution back to the last mile where the farmer is in need. So please think about it. Um, today is, is a great day to donate, um, but if you want to think about it and make a pledge later on, that's also most welcome. And if you can tell a couple of friends, uh, that will also help. 
us um, to continue to support these kinds of efforts on the ground. So again, there's the donate link, aidindia.org slash support farmers. Um, hmm. We have the, uh, let me just reload the website here and it shows, yes, it shows that we are about a quarter of the way to the target. I guess in that sense, we might, um, you know, that that might be where a lot of people are this year uh, with respect to um, how they're doing uh, compared to their goals. But together we can make it happen. And uh, I know that by the end of the year, we will reach this target and, and other targets because so many volunteers are working so hard uh, for this cause. And we appreciate all of you who have joined this call. Yeah. Um, thank you so much, Arvinda, for being part of the donation page and helping us uh, reach there and support the farmers. Today we have Indra Singh, one of our in uh, Ann Arbor volunteer, to end the session on a high note, singing "Yajo Deshe Tera" from Swadesh. Hello, everyone. This is Indra Singh. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Let me just start the video. Okay. Can you see me now, really? <clears throat> okay. uh, so are you guys able to see me and hear me? Yes, okay. yes. Okay, so I'll get started. Yeah, 
पर दूर तू है अपने घर से आ लौट चल तू अब दीवान जहाँ कोई तो तुझे अपना माने आवाज दे तुझे बुलाने वही रे ये जो देश है तेरा स्वदेश है तेरा तुझे है पुकारा ये वो बंधन है जो कहीं टूट नहीं सकता Thank you so much, Indra Singh. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Indra Singh. Very nice. Very very. Nice. Thank you. It's beautiful. I, yeah, I was I was in uh, actively connected to the AID before uh, during my university days and college I just did, but not recently very much connected. But today's uh, today was a great experience. Thank you for a very good presentation and all the Q and A was great. So thanks to AID, uh, uh, the Ann Arbor team who is actively doing all these gatherings. Thank you. Thank you for reconnecting. <laughs> and uh, we want you to stay connected. I'd like to ask everybody um, from Aid Ann Arbor, as well as everyone, to uh, turn on your video for the for the final closing. Um, Srijana, take it away. Srijana, I think you're going to tell people how they can get involved in Ada and Arbor. Yeah. Uh, so as I said in the beginning, we do have a meet, week, meeting once every two weeks. Uh, we discuss about various projects and the events that we can do so that we can raise funds to support projects in India. Um, we also have a book club where we take up uh, a book every, uh, I think every two to three months. We decide upon a book through a poll and then uh, discuss our views, insights, etc. through the book club meeting, and we are also planning on uh, doing it like a collaboration with other chapters so that everybody can pitch in for the books, etc. So if you are interested um, to volunteer with us, take up any kind of task that you are interested in. It might be anything that that is of your interest. Like you are interested in design, you are interested in a meeting. Every support matters. So. Um, if you are really interested in volunteering with us, please do sign up. The sign up sheet will be provided in the chat box. And thank you everyone for joining us today. Thank you, Kiran, for that heartwarming presentation. It was really, really uh, helpful for us to understand how we are trying to help the farmers and to make a difference in their lives. Yeah. Thank you everybody for joining. And uh, thank you, Kiran. Thanks everyone else for joining.